All right, I'm Joe Monica. I'm from the Brain Initiative. I work in the Office of the Brain Director, and I'm here with Grace Wong, who I'm sure many of you know, who's a program officer with the Brain Initiative. Grace. Um, and so I just want to start off, I, we do have a couple of workshops we want to announce. Um, in the, uh, November 12th and 13th, we're going to have a two-day hybrid workshop focusing on, uh, I guess, the, this new intersection, what we're, what we're calling NeuroAI. Uh, we're, in, we're, we're including some neuromorphic components. I'm going to give you some more details at the end of, end of my talk um, about, uh, about this, and then Grace will also tell you some more about um, other opportunities. Um, but I was really inspired this week, you know, being here and, and listening to all the different themes and topics uh, going on that everyone's talking about. And so I kind of dug into my, my research past and I, 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 I put together kind of a, a scientific technical talk, a little bit of speculation at the end about the controls, maybe that, that'll lead into the next, uh, uh, the next talk pretty well. Um, but yeah, I want to kind of go through, I'm going to take off my government hat and put my scientist hat back on. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm Joe Monaco, a former scientist, um, speaking to you. Um, I'm interested in behavior and, and I've more recently been in, in control. And so it's been great to hear all these things. Um, but as, as far as um, how behavior interlinks with, with uh, the complex temporal dynamics that we all know exists in brains. Um, so my career started way back in the previous century uh, is you know, kind of modeling hippocampus. So uh, that's another you know, very tight knit uh, you know, theory in, in, in computational uh, research community. Um, and and it's, you know, I think is is a, you know, so what are we looking at here? Are those arrows? <laughs> so, so if you take uh, this beautiful rat and you slice its, its brain uh, its actually and you, and, you, and you do a basic stain for cell bodies, you see this nice uh, dense layer um, you know, uh, of the C1, C3 up top, and then, uh, well, sorry, C3, C1, then take gyrus. I'm going to show a few more pictures. Um, I have probably way too many slides, but just to get everyone oriented, this is the, the seat of episodic memory. Um, one trial learning, this is, you know, uh, lifelong learning in the brain, which is something that AI probably needs and it doesn't really have. And so you can make uh, you know, the hippocampus look really pretty. You can zoom in on these nice crambo layers. Uh, there is a, a lot of structure here, um, but it's you know conventionally called the trisomic circuit. Um, and it, and so C well, so C A three is very recurrent. Uh, there's this little area called C A two. People are starting to figure that out. C A one is kind of this area which receives lots of sensory input from the around the cortex so you, and you, compares it. You you said that there are two layers of graminal cells. Is that right? In C A one, that the yeah, it, it's I don't have the citation on top of my head, but there is a superficial layer and a deeper layer of graminal cells, and they have slightly different connectivity with the uh, local internal populations and and interrhinal. Mm -hmm. The so, so what's like the relative number of the superficial cranial cells versus the that is way into the weeds of not my work um this is pretty picture to get everyone oriented around the <laughs> hippocampus um i've been you know so i'm not a practicing scientist at the moment it's been a couple uh, years since I've, uh, but i, I want to bring you through some some of the work um and you know there's been you know decades and decades of work since essentially since uh, john o'keefe discovered play cells uh these are the cells that fire at one particular location in a given environment um and that constructs a cognitive map and then those maps can, can completely change in a new environment and so it's this great context code that, that underlies you know the basically the, the distinguishability of, of long-term uh, memories um but there's you know a lot of work trying to assign different functions to different parts of, of the hippocampal and parahippocampal uh, systems. And if you're really interested in spatial navigation, you want to know like what are the spatial variables and correlates that, that are kind of generated by, by uh, the hippocampus and its main cortical input, which is which is this, this enteral cortical layer. So in 3D, you can kind of see the hippocampus has this like long uh, axis going from the, the, the uh, septal pole to the uh, uh, temporal pole um, and you get really good uh, spatial representations up here. They, they become fuzzier and bigger scale as you go towards the temporal pole. And it's like a hot dog or banana that's basically wrapped by this entorhinal cortex. And the entorhinal cortex is where you find the, the, the famous grid cell that also won the Nobel Prize in 2014 along with John O'Keefe for discovering uh, the play cells which kind of look, look like that. Um, and while well, the grid cells are on the medial part of the entorhinal cortex, the, on, the, on the lateral side, things are a little more complicated, but they tend to be like memory by object relationships. Um, so uh, Jim Kinnearm's lab and others have done lots of great work showing if you have objects in an environment, you, you have place field like firing associated with those objects. And then you can see like mismatch uh, uh, responses if you move the objects around. Um, that's so it's kind of like objects and space all coming together. And that's the basis. Um, so that's what you know, hippocampal modelers traditionally studied. Um, but if you step back and like, well, how do you actually, you know, get those fi average firing rate maps in this you know, one meter square environment? Um, well, it kind of looks like this. This is obviously not the actual speed, but, you know, you have a tetrode bundle recording from, from uh, you know, these play cells in the hippocampus. 
uh, and you just let a, a, you know, a rat randomly forage around for a very long time. Uh, they get a little bit bored. There's different ways of motivating them to do this. So each color is a different neuron, right? So sorry, each each of those dots of a different color is a spike from from the same neuron. So this is showing you an ensemble of ten different neurons, you know, with the diff different colors there. And so basically, you do this long sampling period. This was like a, that was a 40, 40 minute uh, session. Uh, this was not my video. This is from Roddy Grease, UCL. Um, but that's that's the whole idea. There's like there's a lot of that's 40 minutes of behavior um, looking at basically to construct those fields that we're outlining there at my And so then, then you get something like this you get trajectories, you get a bunch of spikes from each cell on the top layer. Um, so if this isn't familiar to folks, I mean, so the, the gray line is that whole trajectory just uh, uh, rastered out there. And then the red uh, dots are the spikes on top of that. You can construct these average spatial firing rate map, and that's those guys. And for a long time, decades, we study these things and how they move around for different environmental manipulations. And so this is kind of, um, you know, probably one of the strongest examples of a clear neural code at the cognitive level, the high level cognitive code in the brain. And the spike rates are really, that's the peak spike rate that when you say like five hertz or something, that means that's the peak. Right, these are all jet color map normalized to the peak. And so it's telling you what the maximum. Yeah, it's very low spike rate, right? So it's really yep. sparse coding. And yes. what was the yes. a week or so ago that asserted that these place field cells are really not encoding the place. They're really like an error signal or something. What was that about again? That might have been talking about C1. That was, that, was that was last week, that was um, Tuesday. Dude, that's you, Jerry, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a different, but that was a model that we developed and it's a hypothesis. Uh, and it's known that these space fields will fade over, over weeks and, and the, the prediction error. Right, yeah, yeah. So, so the technology now is you can do longitudinal record, recordings of these over many weeks and then you do see this kind of drift. And so that ties into the whole representation of drift story. Um, but the whole idea is like, um, this has been studied for many decades and it seems like we need to move beyond that to some of the complexity. And so uh, one of the other major features physiologically of the hippocampus is, is it's, it is the seat of, of like the strongest slow rhythm in the brain, essentially uh, the, the theta rhythm. Um, so we think we've heard a little bit about this before, but you know, if, you're, if you stick a, an electrode and, and, a, and a reference into, into the hippocampus, almost anywhere you can see these in, in the LFP, the local field potentials, you see these kind of slow peaks that about you know, 120 mm -hmm. to 150 or so milliseconds. Um, and if you do, you know, a band pass filter, you get these, this nice theta wave. And this is when the animals are engaged with the environment, when they're, when they're moving around, et cetera. Um, and, and, and then, you know, the cells are also spiking, of course. And so one of the things I'm going to talk about a little bit later is the relationship between spikes and, and the phase. So it's just to give you a historical, I mean, this, John O'Keefe did his work and when? Uh, when we discovered place L71, uh, but uh, phase precession was 93. Okay, but, but, okay, we're talking about the 70s. This is a time when almost all neuroscience was done with animals that were locked down, looking at a, a, a screen or doing something. But this was actually animals that were freely moving in an environment. And, and, uh, and, and uh, you could never have discovered a place field if the animal was locked down in the in corner someplace, right? So, mm -hmm. so this is really uh, very special. And that was his original experience. It was a pretty small box. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't the one meter by one meter that everyone uses now, but it had like seven different parts. You need to label them A, B, C, D, and F or, or something. And it was just a very clear spatial selectivity. And that, that started off the whole the whole field. Um, and uh, yeah, so just to kind of summarize, like, you know, if we're thinking about neural coding and what is the hippocampus doing with the rest of the brain, you know, at least the, the way I came to think about it is like there's there's two main building blocks or dimensions along which uh, the hippocampus is, is, is you know, performing its functions. And one is through, um, you know, uh, this kind of oscillatory temporal dynamics. And the other through, is through these, these uh, uh, population dynamics characterized by, by uh, uh, you know, strong attractors um, and, and, and attractor maps. And so what I was just telling you about theta phase or, so the 1993 result from John O'Keefe and, and Michael Ritchie um, was that um, as the animals move move along, uh, you know, a, a, a track, you see this kind of like monotonic relationship of, of the phase of spiking um, with with uh, as, as as they go through a place field. And so, if you just summed up and ignored the phase, you would see a nice Gaussian place field here. Um, but if you break it down across phase, then you always see this kind of uh, this this striking monotonic downward um, phase relationship, where as the rat enters a, a place field. Uh, you have a, a late phase, and then it becomes progressively earlier and earlier within the, the, the theta cycle. The spiking comes earlier and earlier within the cycle. Um, and then if we just look spatially, 
uh, so the strongly interconnected you know, intrinsic con connectivity, you get um, you know, uh, attractor map dynamics where essentially, uh, this has been discussed before, where, where, you, where the, the system seems to relax into certain sets of fixed points. Those fixed points can be context dependent and they can, um, they can be, uh, they can be uh, subject to learning. Um, I probably should like move. This is my illustration of, of cell assemblies that maybe underlie some of this. Uh, that's not important. That's just, um, sorry, I'm kind of like losing breath at altitude. Um, but the idea is like, like I was saying, so, so as rats move along and you, you look at the, the activity of the hippocampus and you've got the, these theta cycles progressing, you've, you've got these subsequences that are continuously being generated, um, kind of starting around the trough of each theta cycle and progressing forward. Um, and there's a lot of work showing like, are these theta subsequences doing like look aheads or what role do they play in navigational decision making? Um, but but just really one of the most striking results, you know, um, that has kind of inspired me from a fairly long time ago now uh, from uh, uh, the, the Moser lab in, in 2011. I'm sorry, uh, the Moser, Edvard Moser, who has uh, discovered the, uh, the grid cells. Um, so their lab has done a lot of this follow up work. Um, but they've shown that you can get this, this flickering effect, which is really striking. Um, so if you just look, if, basically, if you construct one of those spatial maps only from the activity within a given theta cycle, and then you just look at each theta cycle and you just partition all that activity um, and, and then do spatial correlations, you can see if you do an abrupt change of context. And so in this case, they have a, a lighting arrangement. They just flip a switch. There's a brand new lighting arrangement. Um, and that's the zero point here. And you can see that the original map in red kind of persists. And then you start getting theta cycles where you have more of this new map, but then it, it flips back to the, to the original map and then goes to the new map and then flips back to the original map. And then, and then it eventually stabilizes on, on the new map. Um, so this has always kind of inspired me because this seems like a tractor dynamics, like every theta cycle, you're, you're rebuilding the whole map, um, but you're rebuilding. It's like, it's making a choice about which map to build, you know, the previous one or the new one. And so it's kind of, you know, interleaved um, in, in, a, in a way that's reminiscent of pattern. So to changing the lighting, what does that mean? Con context. So they're trained individually. So a certain pattern of the blue and green lights and then a certain pattern of like red and yellow lights or something. And so they're trained to a different environment. But is it the same environment? And then, and then they do a test where they just flip a switch abruptly. Right. And then this is what happens. Um, I might have missed it at the beginning, but um, could you give us a clue as to where you're going with this? Because I'm, I, I'm, I sort of feel like I'm seeing a lot of stuff that I don't know. Where we're heading, so I'm not sure if I'm picking up the right things as I, as uh, I go along. Yeah, sorry. This is mostly background on how uh, oscillations and attractor dynamics are important in the hippocampus, and they're important for uh, well, the hippocampus's role in, in the brain more broadly. And so that's the idea that I'm trying to bring together. Okay. Towards um, what? Yeah. Towards okay. robotic control. Right. Okay. So I'm, okay. He's gone. I'm going to get into some projects. <laughs> Okay, so now this is, this is some of my research. Uh, so, so I worked with, with Jim Canaram as a postdoc where we had these circular tracks, rats were running you know, clockwise. Um, and we were really interested, well, we didn't call it active inference back then. It's been mentioned a couple of times, but basically, you know, uh, animals in the world, they need to update their beliefs occasionally when, when the beliefs go out of date. And so this is what it looks like for, for an untrained animal. Um, so this is, you know, this is not your standard lab. Uh, this is a long, long Evans rat, so this is, as natural a rat as you can get in the lab. It's untrained. You just put it on an elevated circular track and you just put, you know, uh, chocolate sprinkles in front of it. Um, and this is, you know, naturalistic behavior. Um, but this, you can kind of get a sense intuitively of what it's doing. It's, it's, there's a partition between forward movement with its head straight ahead and then pauses where it'll move its head um, to, to one side or the other side. Why does the, why does the animal stay in the little area why doesn't it go out to the gray area okay. it's raised that's the carpet that's like three feet down oh, I see. yeah it doesn't want to get off <laughs> um, but but yeah so that was that was kind of the, the genesis of this this project on, on head scanning and uh i think it was uh, mackenzie mentioned uh you know some other uh researcher who, who had to manually engineer uh, behavioral features um you know before 2014 or so and so i was also in that camp uh, this was before 2014 i was doing this and this is you don't have to understand this this is just the the algorithm that i constructed out of my brain and python code about how to detect these lateral head scanning events 
Um, and it did a pretty good job. We spent a very long time validating this with other people in the lab who knew the, knew the uh, uh, behavior really well. And if you look at the internals of my algorithm, it kind of looks like this. There's a histogram on the left. You can kind of see these loops and that those correspond to the, the, the head scanning events. So we can detect those loops and then turn those into you know, head scanning episodes or events. And you see that here in the animation of the rat, which, which I, I drew that myself. So. <laughs> Uh, but, but you can see how it, it, it works pretty well. It, In places, the rat actually turned around and went the other direction. Well, they don't do that. They're well trained. Oh, uh, just uh, like what's that on the trajectory there? Oh, oh, oh they, 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 I mean, they're very uh, you know, flexible. They, they turn around and look. Oh, I see. And, and they, they also rear and kind of like do, they do funny things, but there isn't enough room for them to fully turn around. And also, they're trained to keep going clockwise. They don't get sprinkles if they go kind of clockwise. Um, and it works pretty well. So just to show you, like, you know, this is uh, pre machine learning, pre AI, pre deep lab cut. Um, I was able to, you know, get pretty well validated complex behavior isolated um, and across both circle tracks, hexagonal tracks, uh, you know, familiar environments, uh, unfamiliar environments, totally novel environments, um, and manipulations of the environments um, different, across, across 36 different rats, actually. So this is tons and tons of data. It's like 10 years of, of experiments in the neural lab. I just want to show you an example of like the main effect that we saw. So this is you're, you're seeing red, you know, trajectory as the rat goes around, and the red and the red dots are of course spikes from a, a single place cell. And so we're stopping here because now there's going to be a very strong uh, head scanning event right there. Oh, there's supposed to be supposed to end in the eclipse. Okay, I was supposed to give you a close this week. Well, it showed you. It is pretty cool. It's, it's really striking. I wanted to play the video. <laughs> Because you see very sparse activity, and like we're saying, like, hippocampal activity generally very, very sparse. So if I hit, oh, it doesn't. Um, whatever. Anyway, tons of spikes on this on this on this head scanning event, and, and, and now you continue. Oh, there it is. And then all of a sudden, we have a very strong place field on the very next lap, and on the next lap, and on the next lap, and that keeps going. You know, eight more laps until the end of the session. You keep processing backwards, right? Well, it's the, the field basically ends at, at the at the location where the head scan began. So yes, yeah, so the head scanning with the activity is here, and then you form a, a field leading up to it. Um, and and, and that, 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 that's an effect that we generally saw. Um, so this is one trial learning of like an update of the, the spatial map of the campus based on basically activity, strong activity during one of these like, individual behaviors. So this is pretty striking. I think. So when did they get the chocolate though there? Like, did they get chocolate in that location? Um, well, I mean, that's, that's fully randomized. And so during, during actual testing, I think, I think they're very occasionally given random sprinkles that they, that they seem to be getting bored. I see. But do you have that tracked and labeled in the data? Well, well they, they, they do. Yeah. I mean, so I came in and I collated like 10 years worth of it. So I wasn't one of the original experimenters collected the data. Um, that was, if you saw the person, that was Gita Rao and she was one of the main technicians and she, she had yeah, all of that. But, but just to be clear, was the chocolate given when the animal stopped the head scan, or was it like you know? Uh, well, if you saw the video before, the, the, the sprinkles like put you know a quarter <laughs> or a half lap <laughs> at, a, at a random location. Yeah, I mean the care was taken to randomize. So location. it's not reward related. We don't as much so. as we possibly can. Yeah. Yeah. But but if you know they get bored, and so if they're not moving, we can't do. So that there was an experiment that was done on Genelia where uh, you stimulate the entorhinal cortex and, and you can create a, a place field. And that could be what's happening here. In other words, uh, it's, it, what it's doing is it's stimulating that input is in the apical dendrite and causes a plateau potential, which might be very strong potentiating signal. Right. Yeah. So coming out of Jeff McGee's lab, Jeff McGee, right? Um, they 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 cited this work as as saying that that mechanism may be explaining and you know, at the synaptic level, what was the dendritic level, what, what what was happening here, because we're seeing this behavioral potentiation effect, and so we obviously don't have that dendritic data. Um, but but you know, so part of the framing, at least in the discussion of that first 2015 paper on, on uh, behavioral timescale plasticity, um, they, they they looked at our work and said this you know, their dendritic plateau potential may explain what's happening here, um, which I think is quite possible. Um, uh, so I meant to say, so this is across the entire data set. That I did. This is a, a, a nine, uh, this is almost a thousand place fields where we, so uh, what we did is we detected all, all sessions where we had a place field recording where the place field either appeared or was strongly potentiated in the middle of the session. 
So typically, you would just see a strong place field all the way through. So you would see, you know, just these, these dark ridges all the way to the beginning of the session. Um, but if you see, you know, the dark, you know, you, you, the dark ridge corresponding to high firing rates appear in the middle of the session, it looks like, you know, a strong, strong potentiation event for the place field. And then the idea is, can we associate the Hesse gang events? If you, if you look at the, uh, the earth, it, there's a ghost-like pattern before that strong potentiation event. So it looked yeah. like it was building up. Right. Yeah. No. There's there there's this. It's, it was usually a case that there's some weak or sparse activity in that area. So, but a sub threshold, like it would not have counted as a place field at all. Um, but then these units only counted as a place field. You know, taking into account the whole session once they became potentiated. And we are looking at about five hertz spikes here. So that's fast. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it depends on the window that you choose to compute the firing rate. But uh, yeah. They can go up to 10 or 20, uh, you know, at the very peak with the short windows. Um, but, but yeah, so this is the idea. I mean, so we found like lots of examples of this throughout this data set. Um, and we did, well, I'm not going to go through all the statistics, but we did, you know, lots of permutation distributions to, to really uh, nail down, you know, an empirical, like, uh, you know, confidence that, that we have a, a strong effect here. And it was about 25% of the time when you saw this kind of like mid-session potentiation or onset of a place field that, yeah, on the very, lap, on the lap before, that's the negative one here, that you did see like strong activity on, on one of these test events. So it had a very high uh, positive predictive value. Um, and if you look backwards, you do like kind of like a windowing analysis and a rock curve. Um, as you kind of like narrow down the window that you're looking at from like 180 degrees, that's half the lap, all the way down to like a five degree window, just looking back. So this is like asking the question of the co-localization of the head scanning event with, with firing and whether that predicts the field that appears or is strengthened at, the, at that location at the next lap. And the, uh, the accuracy of the decoder only gets better and better the more specific um, the, the, or the narrower the window is. So, are the head scans only when they stop moving? They're during pauses. Yeah. So you just get more spikes by that by default, right? Like if you stop, you're probably getting more spikes there versus because the fire rate is so low. Well, that's part of the, the statistical uh, testing that we did. I mean, so we, we basically collated all the pause non scan and pause scan data and used and, and then did shuffles to make sure all the behavior was as equivalent as possible. And then you get you know, time shuffles of the spiking and, and behavioral shuffles uh, to create the distributions. Um, every way we sliced it, we were able to get significant uh, effects. Uh, but they can't ever, sorry to harp on this, but they can't ever be running and scanning while rearing. So like rearing be, and scanning <laughs> is not possible. So that's like a very unique behavior event that they're gonna pause longer, they're 3D, they're rearing. Yeah. So how do you control for them? Well, I mean, so the, the prior going into this was, you know, Gita, who had been running these last rats for 10 or 15 years at that point, like her intuition was like, these are totally mutually exclusive. Like the head scan events only happen during pauses. And so part of that out detection algorithm I showed you was basically looking at, you know, the, you know, the speed as a proxy for running. And then if that became low enough, then, then, then there's a, a pause. And then you can start looking for the lateral uh, loops. Um, that was the idea. Um, so pretty good effect over many, many animals, over many uh, yeah, different conditions. And just to kind of show what it kind of looks like over time in one session, looking at an ensemble, I think it's kind of uh, uh, instructive. So if, so this is 20 laps of, across a session uh, in a new environment. You can see you know, this very sparse spiking uh, you know, from these five place cells at the beginning. At the end, you've got very strong fields, uh, but in the middle, you kind of see that the map is actually being built up. And the, the spikes that you see here, um, well, in blue are head scan spikes, not place field spikes, and ones uh, surrounded by dotted uh, boxes. Um, are during head scan events. And the new environment is basically different patterns in the plot. What does the new environment mean? Uh, well, that's um, when the rat is first introduced to uh, that, that circular track. But that's it, and you don't change the patterns. The the, uh, the patterns are changed, so that's that's the that's the alter so that's the alteration. Okay. Uh, the hexagonal tracks were a novel, familiar paradigm. The circular tracks are a familiar with altered texture paradigm. So local cues were changed. So, so you don't expect full global remapping, but partial remapping. But the thing is, before the, each place field comes online, you see the, the head scanning activity preceding the, the first detected spikes, the place field. And so it's always behavior spikes, behavior, place field, behavior, place field, behavior, place field. So obviously, 
I really love this work. It's super cool. Did you actually ever see the opposite? That basically there was a place there, and then you have a head scan, and the animal is like, oh, that was wrong. And the next lab, it's gone. So like supplementary figure number three. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, go, go to the paper and, uh, and it's, 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 uh, um, yeah, we did find it. It's a fewer example, but there was a, a head, head scan driven that we could perfect. Sorry, but is this a full list of situations where this occurred? List of situations? Uh, where you found head scanning and then a new place where this is a full list of uh, This is all place fields that were potentiated mid session in a single session of one rat. Um, I, I don't know exactly what type of set. Oh, no, no sorry. I didn't read it in the novel room. So, this, this is the, yeah, the first time the, a given rat was in the environment. Um, it takes a few laps. So, this is you know, less than a minute or so until you start seeing place fields. And then, but they come online in a staggered way and almost, in, in this case, always preceded. So each row is a different rat. No, no, no. This is five simultaneous place fields in the same rat. Uh, and I'm not picking and choosing. This is all of all of the ones that. that, that uh, are, are they in order? They're in order of, of when they came, when the place right, field right, came. What about their, their location on the circle? Oh, I, I can't. Oh well, I mean, you can see it. It's here, right? So this is this is the lapse. So you know, one, two, three, four. Oh, this is space. Right. This is the circle track. Right, right, right. Yeah. So that's that, that's that's the idea, kind of like. Maybe we can think of active inference as kind of like this behavior driven, like updating of, of you know internal representations, internal beliefs about about the world, um, and but so if there's any questions at this point, I was going to kind of move on to a subsequent you know modeling work, which is basically okay, fine if you use behavior and active inference perhaps to construct these like amazing internal you know cognitive mapping representations. Um, Representations really only matter if you use them for something. Uh, and so uh, our subsequent work kind of looked at, well, um, path integration, which is you know, this other component of navigation is like, how do you actually read out cognitive maps? And so if you have an animal, it's at the beginning of a journey and you know, it's, it's, it's gonna make its way to various waypoints. It has to have an internal representation of its current position on the journey. And it probably wants to maintain a homing vector so it knows how to go home to find shelter from any point. Um, but you know, there's this kind of problem where uh, if you're doing path integration, which is you know, dead reckoning, that means you're, you're looking at self motion, you're, in, you're integrating your heading angle and your velocity, like that, there's, that's an error prone, error accumulating process. And so the uh, internal you know, positional estimate tends to drift off of, 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 of uh, you know, the actual position of the animal um, over time. And the idea is that path integration, you need to reset every so often. I mean, I think in this is uh, a common problem in robotics and SLAM. Uh, like how do you actually you know, get back on course um, if you're just relying on odometry or whatnot? Um, so the idea is like you can come to landmarks occasionally and those landmarks will reset you back onto the right path. But you kind of like drift and then you get reset, you drift, you get reset, you drift off and you get reset. And now it's kind of been a longstanding question about well, how does the whole system actually reset itself? Um, uh, you don't have to, I'm not going to go into detail on this. This was a very early model, basically taking a very simple um, um, multiple oscillator approach where like, you assume we have a bunch of place fields on these like circular tracks. So I had actual behavior data, um, but I put a very simple uh, theta uh, oscillator model um, as a use of the place field here. And since they're theta oscillators, but they're also spatially modulated, um, as you go forward, uh, they, they interfere with each other. And so the interference between the, the fields kind of creates these bumps of activity, which are themselves theta rhythmic. So you can look for constructive interference, but a threshold on that. Uh, and then you've got theta rhythmic bumps resulting from synchronization of, of many um, oscillating uh, play cells. And so then we posited that, well, like, what, what does a landmark or queue do? Um, so in, in time, so we, if you see the background here, there's kind of this, this Gaussian bump in time, and that's like the influ influence or effect of a, of a queue. And so if the phase code for, the, uh, for these oscillators has drip, drifted off space, then, then the queue basically just normatively, you know, phenomenologically in the model, just brings everything back to where it should be. And so that, so that allowed us to look at the dynamics of a phase correction and that's able to explain you know, some partial remapping at place. Um, I'm losing a breath. Yep. Yeah. So Noah and Noah Cowan and uh, Jim Kimmerin just published a paper where they're basically saying that um, ultimately the landmarks is not as important as um, optical flow. What's your thoughts on that? 
Um, well, we'll reset it. We'll so reset if you're it. talking about Jim, so you know, Jim Canaram has a new paradigm that he calls the virtual dome where basically they have an arm and a little vest and they put the rat in the vest. And so the rat is just basically, it's, it's, it's locked into only going around at, at one radius around the circle. Um, but they're projecting on the inside of the dome, a star field essentially. And they can change how like landmarky the star field is. Sometimes it's just like a, a random dot field, like an actual star field. Sometimes they can put, they can draw actual landmarks onto it. So I think that they, they do have a nice like continuum between the two. But, um, but, 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 but you can do, yeah, yeah, yes. The yeah, optic flow is all you need, basically. Yeah, that's what basically is. Right. Well, in that paradigm, and I think I, yeah. landmark well, identity well, probably well, does matter. Probably, well, maybe for humans or or, or primates more, more so than rats. What? Other point. Uh, but anyway, um, yeah. <laughs> but but that, that's a very simple model, and so you know, as I was going along, I got more interested in, in, in you know in, in the. Uh, the complexity of the temporal dynamics here. And so if you look at real data, you know, play cells, they spike, they spike at a certain, you know, phase of, of the theta of each theta cycle. And so that's another coding dimension. So this is a, there's a, there's a phase code here. Um, uh, I'm probably gonna skip past this. I had, okay, you know, this background, like how to construct a, a you know, maybe if you have questions about this uh, later, but, um, you know, you have sets of ionic conductances and neurons, so you can have a neuronal oscillator. You can have the uh, EI circuits, uh, you know, where you have excitatory and inhibitory cells working together. Uh, you know, so you're in different, you know, positive feedback or negative feedback regimes, and so there's a lot of different ways to construct oscillators um, in in cells and circuits, um, but they tend to have the same kind of non nonlinear dynamics that um, you know the push and pull at the right phases. Um, yeah, this is too much. I'm, I'm going to move beyond this, but um, you know, just in terms of nonlinear dynamics, it's 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 you know you're looking for bifurcations into stable limit cycles, and that's and then the stable limit cycles, um, if if they can be perturbed, uh, if you can move those phases around, you can if you can move the system differently, then you can store information in the phase of the limit cycle. Um, so, kind of taking a simple a simple version of that, um, if you have in the EI population again, the you know, hippocampus is has tons and tons of inhibitory interneurons, many different types of, uh, of uh, sources of inhibition. Um, so that strong theta rhythm is really driven by inhibition. And so you can presume if we have a place cell, uh, it's, it's receiving some like sinusoidal oscillatory input um, that, you know, at, at, the, at the theta frequency. Um, and we can just, we can take a you know, very simple integrated fire uh, neuron, that's the red trace up here, and, you know, show where it's spiking. And the reason I'm showing you this is that, okay, this is maybe a reason for the sparse spiking because if you have the right kind of threshold against this oscillating background, then you're just going to get the occasional spike. Um, but the, the spikes are going to happen at a certain phase. But that changes with the threshold. So, you know, low low firing rate, low threshold. Or, well, sorry, this is more excitatory drive because the the pink is an inhibitory input, so it's a little bit backwards. But you know, the idea is the same. So you change. Uh, the relative uh, EI balance, you get you know faster firing rates, but you get this kind of like theta bursting, and this comes very naturally out of a very simple model. Um, and you, you go, you really put it out of balance, and you can like maximize the firing rate of the cell, um, and you can see that the, uh, you get these kind of four stereotype bursts. Um, so if you kind of look at the uh, distribution of the theta spike phase as you do this kind of thing, um, you'll notice that uh, you know you have a very low firing rate. Uh, with, with that lower uh, or with that lower excitatory balance, um, but that gives you that early firing. So we can plot that here on on a on a, on a axis of, of firing rate against first phase. Of course, we've changed that threshold again, and now we're at a different location. We have a higher firing rate, but we've advanced the phase, and again, uh, the maximum firing rate we're close to, um, and then the, the earliest phase within the theta cycle. And so this is kind of this negative correlation that you naturally expect um, between firing rate and phase for, for kind of a simple formulation of, of, of uh, a spike phase code. And the interesting thing is without any learning, this is symmetric. So that the idea is if you have like a ramping excitatory input, it just ramps up and ramps down. You see a symmetric relationship between uh, the firing rate and the phase on, on both sides, on the, on the up ramp and the down ramp. And so you would expect that you know, if you have you know, a ramping input that goes up and down, you, you would expect to trace out this kind of you know, very nice negative uh, rate based correlation. 
which is interesting because this is not what you typically see into the hippocampus. So I mentioned phase procession before, the animal goes through a field, it starts uh, late and then becomes progressively earlier, but it's, it's non-monotonic. So as the animal goes through a field uh, in, in, uh, in the hippocampus, you know, CA3 or CA1, you get that, you get that decrease, but then it, it, it doesn't come back. But how, how can you, how can you do it based when you're talking about the mean firing rate? What does that mean? I mean, um, multi, well, for multiple tra traversals through the same field. Oh, multiple. Yeah, so imagine you've computed those average spatial firing rate maps or firing phase maps, and now we're just looking at pixel to pixel correlations. I see, not mean firing rate. Okay. Sorry, yeah, sorry about that. Okay. Um, yeah, but the idea is that, like, you can have the symmetric, uh, you know, uh, the spatial phase code or any kind of uh, phase code uh, pretty easily, but in, in place cells and the main, you know, place cell networks of hippocampus, you don't see that. You see this non monotonic phase procession. And this is due to learning and the interconnectivity. And, you know, this is theorized to be the source of producing uh, hippocampal sequences and all, and all of that. But it seems like a symmetric code would be useful. And so I was interested in, in, in looking for this. And so this is a collaboration with him, Tad Blair at UCLA. Um, and he does these kinds of spatial navigation random foraging experiments. Um, but he was interested in all these like subcortical, subcortical areas that support the hippocampus and bare hippocampal um, uh, networks. And so he did recordings uh, kind of in all these other areas, which people typically ignore, uh, the septal bodies, lateral thalamus, ventral pigmental area. People ignore it who come from the hippocampal literature. They're not ignored. Um, uh, supramammillary nucleus, which is strongly theta rhythmic. Yeah, so this, so he just did this, like broad, you know, a, a sweep of recordings across the subcortex, um, looking for kind of phase relationships that were not phase procession. Um, he was interested in a different theory than I was, but I worked with him on the data set. Um, and basically, what I found was that that symmetric phase code, I only found it in one part in one anatomical area in his data set, and that was that was lateral septal. And so the recordings kind of look like this. So this is long, like an hour long recording, you see it spikes, uh, strong spatial selectivity, but then we can compute those average firing rate maps, well, firing rate maps and average uh, spike phase maps. So this this bottom map is the average theta phase of spiking you know, across that environment. And of course, so once you have those, you can, you can, you can correlate them. And if you do that, then you say, you see we have this nice strong negative uh, rate phase relationship, rate phase rate, I'm never sure. Which one goes first, but you get that negative relationship that you, you expect out of a symmetric spatial phase code, which is cool. Um, but you know, so maybe I should, I should skip through this. I have details on how I detect these cells, um, but basically, I had a number of conditions on, uh, on the stability of, 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 of spatial coding, looking at that phase rate correlation, and I was able to like filter Tad's data set across the subcortex, looking for these types of cells. I found them, they're stable, they do have the right kind of coding. Um, there's a trade-off between speed and spatial coding. Um, we use a GLM to, to decompound uh, spatial position from, from, from the things that we care about in, in the code. So these are trajectory independent spatial codes, yeah, spatial data codes. Um, and well, this is just showing that these are all the negative phase rate codes. The, the surprising thing was though, we, we found cells up here, which met all the right criteria. They're going the opposite direction. So we found some positive phase rate correlated spatial phase coding cells. Which you didn't really expect based on that simple relationship, um, but if you think about network effects, this is probably in, in, in ways that you can do it. You know, one or two synapses out. Um, this, so, so these are just examples of the spatial profiles that you see for uh, what I ended up calling phaser cells, um, which I guess other people call other types of things phaser cells. But I thought it was cool at the time. Um, but you, you see these very nice negative phase rate relationships. Um, and these are examples of the positive phaser cells. They tend to be less spatial. It's like less spatial information in the positive phaser cells, which I think makes sense because if it's more of a network effect, maybe the positive uh, phaser cells receiving inputs from, from uh, you know, multiple spatial sources, multiple uh, theta, theta uh, rhythmic sources, then uh, the resulting code is, is this less spatially uh, informative. But they're all there in the lateral cells, which is interesting. Um, and and if, you, if you look at where uh, those two subpopulations of, of phaser cells um, align with, with respect to the ongoing theta oscillation, they're actually very well interleaved. So the, the purple histogram here 
shows you the negative theta cells and while the orange-ish colored ones uh, histogram is, is the positive phase of cells. So as the th you know, theta oscillation goes along, you get you know, strong activation of the negative uh, phase of cell pop population. And then as you get towards the peak of the theta cycle, um, you get the positive. And so in that sense, the entire theta cycle is, is covered um, by these spatial phase coding relationships, which might be useful. Uh, and so I need to move on very quickly, but we did some modeling of, of this. Uh, you know, so these are adaptive exponential neurons, basically you know, that in a very simple way, replicate these relationships that we saw in the data. And we use that GLM that we did for the analysis, uh, basically turn it into a generative model um, to generate new spatial tunings. And so I could generate thousands of negative, you know, model negative phasor cells, um, as well as model positive phasor cells. And, and that allowed us to do kind of a larger scale yeah, mid-scale uh, modeling of, of synchronization effects um, based on the uh, the state phase code that we found in lateral coupling, um, and just to kind of very quickly go through it, um, you know, bring coding and robotic. Yes, I mean, I need to I need to move fast. But the idea is we looked at so ring ring attractors were, were mentioned uh, or, or the ring networks were, were mentioned earlier. Um, so you, you can imagine that there's two different configurations of decoders for this type of, of, of code uh, for this type of input from uh, from these phasor cell populations. Um, one is if you you just be sampling across all the, the, the different preferred uh, directions of, of a ring network, um, or you could be sampling across ring networks uh, where you have the same preferred direction, um, but with different spatial offsets. Um, and it turns out uh, you can train downstream decoding neurons uh, you know, on these phasor cell populations. They, they can pretty good, well, roughly learn uh, these, these spatial phase codes. Um, and then if you do a Bayesian decoding of, of the, you know, the collective uh, population uh, phase coming out of those, uh, those uh, downstream uh, you know, reader networks, um, you get a very clear answer where you don't do very good path integration um, when you're sampling the same preferred direction. Um, but if you're sampling across preferred directions, that kind of gives you the right, you know, spatial and directional uh, uh, basis functions, essentially, to, to uh, reconstruct um, actual trajectories of the animal pretty well. And so this is the kind of thing that you would need to do a, a, a temporal phase-based reset of the path integration system um, that I mentioned earlier. So, but it, it's, it's, it's stable and fast. Um, but, you know, robotics. So I presented this idea to Grayson a, a, a number of years ago, and she's like, well, can you use phase itself to control robots? And then I, I laughed at her at first. Um, but, but she's very intuitive. And so we started thinking about this and we started thinking about, you know, collective dynamics. And we're like, well, maybe if we you know, reconceptualize a hippocampal network with these properties, but, but as, you know, a multi-agent group uh, that, that's kind of like has self-organized coordination, um, what would those coordination dynamics look like if they're based on kind of these ideas of tracker dynamics and, and oscillatory synchronization in the hippocampus? Um, so that ended up uh, turning into this project that are called Neuroswarms, where uh, it's an analogy essentially between you know, these kind of hippocampal networks that I was talking about, where you have place fields and the tractor dynamics, et cetera. Um, but it's an analogy with like uh, goal or target fields and, and robotics where you have multi-agent groups. Um, and so this ended up being a collaboration between uh, where I was, School of Medicine at Hopkins and, um, <clears throat> and the Applied Physics Lab there. Uh, they have you know, people who work with autonomous systems and control. And so this was a really interesting collaboration with mathematicians, engineers, uh, on their side, and 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 uh, Keshen Zhang and I uh, on the School of Medicine side, uh, working on on the theory and modeling, um, and we got some you know, really interesting things to come out of this. Um, and but what we found was that you need sparsity. You need sparsity, different kinds of sparsity. You need a diversity of, of sparsities. Um, and and one of those is that is you know, structural uh, sparsity coming out of you know you know. Maybe I want to call it a heterarchy here, but you know, they're coming out of spatial geometry. You need temporal sparsity where the agents are interacting, but only uh, you know according to some uh, oscillatory phase coupling. So when things are, uh, when two agents are in the uh, are, are aligned in phase, they they interact in one way. If they're uh, not aligned, they interact uh, differently, and that allowed us to get repulsion and attraction and to study swarming. And so, well, how do we drive swarming? Well, let's like, just take you know, heavy and learning rules essentially. Uh, and apply it to, to spatial swarms of many agents. Um, and so what we did, uh, you know, we take a, a kernel essentially to translate uh, like synaptic connectivity into spatial distances. Um, 
and we can do that with the Gaussian kernel or various other kernels. Uh, we implemented a, you know, a cosine phase difference coupling. So this is kind of that oscillatory coupling. Um, and that drives attraction and repulsion processes between a bunch of agents that you can put into an environment. Um, and here's kind of that learning rule. This is basically the Oyo's rule, which is a normalized version of you know, general heavy and learning. Um, so it, it doesn't explode, which is good, because if you just implement naive heavy and learning, uh, bad things happen. Uh, so, but this is very basic stuff that's been, you know, in the you know, in the theoretical neuroscience literature for, for uh, a very long time. Um, and then, of course, once you've done the learning, the synaptic style learning, you have to convert back into um, uh, uh, motion update vectors. Um, and so I just want to show kind of the opposite of an ablation. So if you start with without any phase cup coupling or anything, you put a bunch of agents into a space and they're kind of attractive, they just form a black hole, um, which is probably what you expect. Uh, so now we can turn on the phase coupling uh, uh, with identical initialization. And you also get a black hole, but then it kind of drifts off into some weird uh, dynamics, which I don't really have time to show. But, um, but if you randomly initialize the phases of these things, then you activate kind of like this, this general repulsion between them. And then like, okay, we're getting something more interesting here. They kind of blow apart. They tend to aggregate. And you'll notice like there's these rainbows of colors. And so if, like, as the colors line up, that means you're, you're, there's, there's some phase organization to the structures. Um, but this is a little over, uh, overdriven. Um, so, but let's, if we take those, just a couple of parameters in, in this type of model, if you, if you just balance them a little bit, it doesn't require fine tuning, it's very easy. You put them into a slightly more constrained environment, and then all of a sudden you have really interesting coherent behavior coming out of this, um, where you see, you know, uh, your phase organized arcs and lines and trajectories emerging. Um, the, the, the gold stars are, are attract, attractive locations, and the, uh, the purple shapes are just spatial cues that kind of you know, differentiate the environments. Um, but we can do something else with that. So that's multi-agent, but we can basically kind of invert the whole thing again and say, well, that swarm, let's consider that swarm to be like a virtual internal mental or cognitive swarm for a single agent. So now that's what we're showing here. So it's like a little, uh, or there's a larger green circle there. And, and the dots are this internal mental swarm. And, and if you just do a very simple rule to guide the motion of, of the single entity um, agent based on what's happening in, in, in the, uh, the, sw the swarm, it does pretty well. It just kind of naturally traverses the environment and finds all the stars. And this, take the exact same model, you can put it into a large fragmented hairpin maze. It does the same thing. It finds all the stars. This actually completes the whole maze if you give it enough time, which is kind of cool. Um, so what's the, the, the uh, global theta uh, rhythm? How's that supported in the swarm? There's a, uh, well, there's an implicit theta rhythm that, that governs the, the, the phase. Right. So, how, but how do the agents keep that coordinated? Uh, they, well, they have a, they, they know their own preferred phase, which evolves with, with, with the rhythm. So, technically, you could have a frequency of zero of, of this internal uh, rhythm because all, all the, the only thing that, that's, that's actually interacting here is the, um, or operational, is the phase difference. Um, but each agent is tracking its own phase difference. So How do is they this, know that though? That's the question. How do they know what the others have? Yeah, there's a, there's a random offset between every agent at the beginning, right? Right. And well, I mean, that's handled phenomenologically by that, that cosine of a phase difference. I mean, so there, there could be a more mechanistic version of that where there's a communication. So, so if you did this with an actual, um, where, you're where each agent is inferring an external rhythm, then, then you can make it work. But, but this so is, this a, is a, a quick question about, I mean, this is, I think this is like a Kuramoto model. It's well, related. Related, right. yeah, but in Kuramoto, typically you get synchronization and you're not, right? You're getting some kind of uh, coordinated phase shifts, right? Right, yeah, so there's this, this pockets of attraction and pockets of repulsion and, and that, that kind of leads to this, this self-organization. I mean, it's kind of like a Mexican hat idea, but it, it's, it's through this temporal interaction that happens or coordinated dynamics. And you can do the same thing for the complex double teammates. And you get something that looks like um, vicarious trial and error, like it'll go back and forth and then like, oh, I'll go that way. And then it, it, it solves the maze. Um, and there's, there's no goal here, there's no rewards here. This same model in all of these. So, I mean, okay, very, very quickly. So these ideas kind of all, you know, got me thinking about what we've been talking about here, about AI and how maybe there's new, new, new types of brain-inspired AI that we should be pursuing, that may be supplemented by, by, by neuromorphic uh, 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 ideas uh, that you all are pursuing. Um, and I kind of come back to like, this, this is the, you know, the, a real strong difference between you know, the artificial neural networks, like the, you know, on, the, on the left there, and, and the hippocampal networks. This is you know, it, you know, 
CA1 during an, old, uh, an odor learning test, um, a calcium imaging video. Um, you see the sparse activation. It's so how do we bridge the gap here? So kind of what I you mean, know, I guess as I got, you know, we did all these, you know, the research projects that I just summarized, you know, I, I was thinking about what is the nature of neural coding and what does this actually mean having animals use, you know, these, these maps that they form. Um, and, and I became worried about like, I didn't actually know how to, how to nail it down. And so I, I, the, it came to this idea of external observer bias, you know, and this is something that kind of comes out of like the embodied cognition literature and and and, and the poor e-cognition, which is you know we we need to invert the paradigm. It, all the neuroscience we do is is an external uh, observer. It's the researcher, the person who sets up the apparatus. All these kind of externally imposed uh, constraints on, on on an organism that's your subject. But organisms are you know are, are internally goal driven autonomous agents, um, and so. In a sense, I think to, to really understand neural coding, to, to understand data control, um, you need to understand what it means for an organism to be an inherently autonomous uh, agent uh, that can formulate its own goals um, in order to, to change the world in, in, in the way that supports its uh, survival and, and thriving. Um, and so I've been thinking about the idea. Uh, I mean, just to wrap up, so the, the, the framework is like you, you need sparse, different types of sparsity, so the right kinds of network structure, maybe that supports certain types of control paradigms. Um, you need temporal dynamics that allow you to uh, select different sub networks of, of, of control and coding, um, and you need the right kinds of identity and interactions to uh, to uh, drive the, the development of the internal neural codes and maps um, that allow for effective adaptive behavior, um, and, and and that works very tightly in concert with the behavior. Um, and I have some papers there. Uh, I guess that's. Sure, it was later. How, how does this relate to consciousness? <laughs> <laughs> Funny you would ask. It's a bad, we're out of time. Um, I think we're out of time. So I think if I think people are. Race after the break. I think you should go after the yeah. break. I have another. There's more stuff to come up to the plate. Yeah, but we want to hear about the workshops and things like that from uh, NIH and NSF, and I would think everybody should hear about the brain initiative. But I don't know if it's here now. It's yeah, we should do it now. Right. Do it now. So, yeah, so, do it now. Oh, it's such so, a thing. It's only 40 minutes. Yes, but it's, 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 not, it's not uh, reasonable to ask people. Uh, uh, so we do need a break to have another talk.